Hi, I'm Carney Liddell. I'm a former Paralympian. They always say there's no such thing, so I should say I'm a Paralympian. I'm a mother to a five-year-old boy called Kai. I'm a social worker. I sit on the Premier's Domestic and Family Violence Council, and I'm very proud to be an advocate and activist for my brothers and sisters with disabilities. On 3rd of December, we celebrate International Day of People with Disabilities. So happy International Day of People with Disabilities. This year, CBM Australia will mark the day by focusing on children with disabilities in developing countries and making sure that they start in life, helps them thrive and flourish. There are around 107.5 million children in disabilities in the Indo-Pacific region. They represent 45% of the world's children with disabilities. These children face many challenges, including access to education, access to healthcare, and discrimination. CBM is calling for greater investment in these children. These issues are very close to my heart. I want to share a story about my own education childhood and how important it is to prioritise the needs of children with disabilities. I was born with my disability. I have a muscle wasting disease and my darling parents were told when I was born that their first born child would not walk, would not crawl and would not live past her teenage years. They were also told, whatever you do, don't do any form of exercise or rehabilitation with her, make her as comfortable as possible and put her into a home. I'm very fortunate that I believe that the only reason I'm here today, happy, walking, I only use this thing for like parking, and healthy and working is because I had an amazing family around me. I guess for myself, I didn't really understand that I had a disability until I was about 14 years of age, which is interesting because that was when I broke my first world record at 50 metres freestyle. And the reason I discovered that I was disabled at the age of 14 when I came back to Rockhampton where I was born is that all of a sudden, my school and my community were all worried about public liability or occupational health and safety, or what I call risk. And the most disabling thing for me, I believe, is this misconception that I'm the riskiest person in this room to support, serve, and employ. So at the age of 14, I was told I could no longer play sport at school. I could no longer walk up the stairs. I could no longer do anything physical anymore. And from there, that's really been my fight until the age of 43. And most of us people with disabilities in Australia live on fight mode, fighting to do the basics, fighting for funding, fighting to fly, fighting to get on a ride at a theme park. And those things are very easy to fix because that just means, of course, changing attitudes. I have traveled the world and I've certainly been to many developing countries. And I sit here in a $35,000 wheelchair. My car has a $10,000 hoist in the back of it, which lifts my wheelchair into the car. If you take that away from me, you take away my complete independence. I also have support workers now through the NDIS. Before that, five years ago, I didn't have that. I did everything myself very difficultly. My aging parents had to pay for everything, do everything, pay for the wheelchairs, help me. And it was a really, really challenging life. And the only reason I can actually be a working single mother today is because I have funding for the equipment and support I need to get out the front door of my apartment. Unfortunately, when I open that front door, we need the community to open up their doors because we are the most unemployed group in this country. But we're not here to talk about Australia today. We're here to talk to two very accomplished, impressive humans who are making a name for themselves in their own countries by advocating for the needs of people with disabilities. And I know that I often say I can't wait for the day that I can retire from being an advocate or an activist, which means that we all have the same rights as everybody else. Masalina Luta is a 25-year-old disability advocate from Samoa. She works for the Deaf Association of Samoa and is passionate about climate change and disaster risk education. Welcome, Masalina. Bea Tamano is a 26-year-old disability advocate 
from Kiribati. I'm actually going to get him to say his name. He works for the Kiribati Association of People who are Blind or Vision Impaired, and he is passionate about inclusive education, as we all are. Thank you both for talking with me today and traveling all the way here. I'm excited to have this opportunity to find out more about your work and of course, what happens in your country with people with disabilities. I'm really interested in your own childhood experiences. It's probably the social worker in me. We, we always start with the childhoods. So tell me, Masalina, what was it like for you growing up in Samoa with a disability? Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I will share my experience today. Um, I would like to talk about my experience when I was a child. When I was four years old, I started going to school. And by that time, there's no accessible um, for me. There's no interpreter. I only have my friends around me. And I always ask for help in sign language and they uh, have no idea how to communicate. So most of the time I feel neglected, I feel sad, and I started become focusing on school without interpreters. And my teacher was trying to teach me um, verbal and it's really hard. It's very difficult for me. Most of the time I don't understand and I'm trying to ask them to use sign language, but they always say, no, I need to learn how to speak. So when I go home, my grandmother um, trying to teach me how to speak and how to communicate. So when I go everywhere, I can able to um, to speak. My grade in school is not good. I always um, fail most of my childhood education. And when I started to meet um, sign language deaf in 2012, that is the first time that I saw and it's give me courage that I have found the support for me. Baya, I'm going to get you to say your entire name because I am from a place that you've probably never heard of, just like I hadn't actually heard of your country, which I apologise for. I'm from a place called Rockhampton, which is the beef capital of Australia. So I've got a very Australian accent. So would you mind just saying your full name? My name is Baya and my father's name is Temengo. Beautiful. And your story is a little bit different because you weren't born with your disability, were you? In 2014, when I was 12 years old, and I've got a blind, I'm called blindness, I feel a very difference because when I'm a uh, normal person and I, I can access everywhere, when I wa want to school, I can access globally. When I want, want to sport, can I sport uh, independently? But when I have a disability in 2014 and everything that I already did, already did uh, I have very different because uh, when I want to sport, I can't access to sport. When I want to uh, uh, in school, I can't access to school because no uh, equipment that I, wa I can use to uh, in uh, mainstreaming. So I talked a little bit before at the beginning about the label of being the riskiest person everywhere I go disables me more than my own disability. Let's talk about the stigma and the labels that are attached to you in your country in Samoa. That is most. That is one of the most um, challenge that we face uh, is the discriminate and stigma of children with disability. Um, and it's sad. It's all started from families. Children can't access to education, and they can't support them and encourage them, so they can become confident and able to be in school. So. We really want to teach our people with disability to become 
encourage them to become brave and be able to go and be as the same as other people without disability. And I also feel like there's a lot of um, work that we need to do with our families and people that around us that they people with disability need us there so they have the same rights as others they need to teach them to be accepted and i believe that it's something that we can do to stop that here in australia people with disabilities are the most unemployed group in the country and australia is one of the worst countries in the western world for employment of people with a disability. Is that the case in your country? Yes, yes, it is the same. Uh, there's a few uh, opportunities for employment. Um, sometimes there's lack of support. It is uh, experience for me to know that it's not only us. And it gives us the courage to keep advocate, keep advocate for uh, the support support for people with disabilities to make sure they have the equal rights for um, access in, in employment. Some people think that it's hard and some people think it, it is easy. So it is something that we have to think about that we can do it and encourage and advocate the government for more employment opportunities. But, uh, just recently I was flooded um, in Brisbane and I lost everything in the floods. And I discovered that obviously in a flood, I lost my wheelchair, my accessible electric bed. And I found that people with disabilities were very left out of the flood recovery services because we couldn't get accommodation that was accessible. I couldn't get a wheelchair because there was no wheelchairs around. There was a six months wait for wheelchairs. In regards to where you live, how are people with disabilities supported when a disaster like a cyclone or a tsunami, or in my case, a flood happens? In our country, and uh, there is a, 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 met, um, a met office is looking for the emergency warning. You know, it's like a strong wind, mm -hmm. uh, rains, and every uh, emergency warning. And in the bus, uh, when they they did an uh, announcement to the public to uh, prepare themselves before the, 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 the strong wind coming. And they already forgot about persons with disabilities, especially persons, uh, uh, deaf persons, because when they did the announcement uh, through the radio and all uh, deaf persons can't hear that announcement. Only persons I can hear uh, can uh, receive the information, uh, access to information about uh, uh, emergency warning. But they forgot about persons with disabilities. That uh, this is in the past. But now, after the uh, we advocate and we advocate to the to the government, and they for now. Uh, when they did uh, the announcement to do the public to prepare themselves before the the big waves or the strong wind, and they 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 did uh, in uh, every social media because uh, they include the needs of deaf persons and especially uh, blind persons for uh, refi uh, they they can access to information about. Uh, the emergency warning, and they for now this is a very uh, access, we can access to information. Uh, uh, deaf persons can receive uh, information from the the med office to provide to prepare themselves before the the emergency. And we are we are field uh, accessible, and we can we can we we can access to information from uh, doing after we advocate to the government. Marcelina, what about in your country when it comes to subtitles and interpreters with disasters? Yes, um, it is the same experience. Like before, we 
don't have the opportunity for our preparation for disaster uh, risk. But at the moment, we have access in um, educating our people with disability in preparedness of disaster. Because before, there's no access in information. And sometimes they use subtitle, but deaf people can't read. And they always rely on their families to give them gestures about preparedness for any disaster. So there's a little information they get from that. And one of the biggest achievements that we have is the opportunity for us to provide for people with disabilities and we're able to educate them and ask them and give them the support that they need, like uh, the interpreters on TV and on videos as well. And also our advocacy organization back there have uh, represent in disaster risk management um, chairs. So there's a person with disability who able to give uh, advice to the government for make sure that they are include people with disability in whatever they do, like in planning and what are they do after the disaster. And this is a great opportunity for us. Has Bea said that before it's um, the people who are deaf is the most um, vulnerable people because they can't hear and they have little understand in disaster. And they, that is one of the reasons that I am happy to sit in this, um, have this opportunity so I can advocate more to make sure that um, information and all the resources that they need for the support of people with disability uh, have the understand and have the resources and make sure the governments are able to support their needs. And the most important thing is um, have them consulted because we believe um, in that mandate that nothing about us without us. Um, we love to see more disability people sitting on the table, um, asking them what uh, they really want to um, get out from that discussion what they really need to support them with um, when it becomes to this um, vulnerable um, group that we are. That's right. And also, that's a great way to employ people with disabilities, isn't it? By having us at the table. So it is International Day of People with a Disability. If I could give you a magic wand <laughs> right now, what's your biggest wish? for your brothers and sisters with disabilities in your country? I think my biggest wish is more collaboration, um, more collaboration with the government, our international partners, and able to network with our um, people with disability organization so that we can share our ideas and able to learn from our small island countries and yeah so we are able to what after this um, meeting we able to uh, bring our experience our ideas uh, back especially in our development um, countries. Baya what would be your big wish? Magic wand you can give me more than one for this International Day of People with Disability for your country. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I want to, uh, to, to make uh, more advocacy to the government to make sure all, uh, all public places are accessible for persons with disabilities. Uh, and also with uh, the terminal, the uh, it provides an accessible places for persons with disabilities when they need, uh, when they access to the, to the uh, airport and they can fully uh, accessible, especially in education, 
Uh, we, uh, I want to, to make uh, my uh, advocacy to the government to improve and to be uh, uh, support more, more support for the uh, to the Ministry of Education. So uh, for the to all mainstream that are provided there, and we want to asking for the government to support to provide more uh, equipment for persons or for students with disabilities around the country. There is so much to be done to ensure a better future for children with disabilities and also us adults in the Pacific. It's been wonderful to be able to talk to you today and learn about your childhood, your experiences and your passion for making the world a better place. I want to thank you as a fellow advocate and as a person with a disability because even in this country, schools aren't actually fully inclusive or accessible. So it's really important for Australians to know that, but it's also important to Australians to know that we can also help other people in other countries that are only getting $4,000 wheelchairs and also unable to access interpreter service to just to be able to do the basic, which is communicate with others and connect. Thank you so much for your time today and everything you've done for us.